Okay, so let us start. Uh, good evening, everyone, including uh, some of our colleagues, uh, including our past colleagues, both on the uh, Zoom as well as on the YouTube. Uh, today's speaker is Professor Vidita Vaidya, and all of you here, of course, don't require any introduction whatsoever, uh, but at least for the benefit of those who are joining on the social media. Uh, let me say a few words about her. Uh, Vidita received her undergraduation from in life sciences and biochemistry from St. Xavier, she is Xavier. Okay. She obtained her doctoral degree in neuroscience at Yale uh, with late Professor Donald Newman and after postdoctoral fellowship at uh, uh, Karolinska Institute and Oxford, she returned to a faculty position at TIFR. This was in uh, year 2000. And uh, she is now a senior professor at TIFR and also fellow of all Indian science academies. Uh, she received probably every conceivable top prizes of this country, um, including the National Bioscientist Award in 2012, the Swarup uh, in Medical Sciences in 2015, and the Infosys last, just last year. Uh, she was awarded the Nature Award for Excellence in Mentorship in 2019. And her research group uh, essentially is interested in understanding the neurocircuitry of emotion, uh, its modulation by life experience and also the alterations of emotional uh, neurocircuitry that underlie complex psychiatric uh, disorders like depression. Uh, she is committed to enhancing equity, diversity, and inclusion in academia. And those of you who have uh, also happened to attend, uh, I would say, not an asset colloquium, but an asset event that happened uh, a few weeks ago in Auditorium Foyer. You will also realize many facets of uh, Vidita. This today's talk, I think, is just one part of that. Over to Vidita. I have an audience which is unreal considering today's rainy day. I was imagining this would be lab meeting uh, because <laughs> my lab might show up. But thanks for coming in on a very rainy Friday evening. Um, also, to people online who are joining in. So. I thought I would use this opportunity to talk about some of the work that we've been doing in the lab, but actually use this more as a chance to introduce you to the sort of revolution in serotonergic psychedelics that is going to be coming our way over the next 20 years. We certainly will expect to see these drugs moving back out of being blocked as Schedule One drugs to potentially being used therapeutically. So I want to talk about that history a little bit as well. So let's start by asking if anyone in this room thinks that they consumed a psychoactive substance today and, um, you know, you're not at risk when you reveal this, but is there anyone in the room who's willing to admit that they consumed something psychoactive today? Anyone? I don't have a single, okay, there's one person back there who says consumed psychoactive substance, one, two, three. I'm likely to make the prediction, what? Okay. Coffee is in that list, absolutely. So psychoactive substances. Oh, yeah, 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 exactly, of course. So so the, the point being that we all consume psychoactive substances daily. We just don't recognize that we are consuming psychoactive substances. And so here's my list. Uh, we will be consuming psychoactive substances when we finish this talk outside as well, right? I'm presuming there will be chai and coffee. So exactly. So you can expect that this is a large part of our daily consumption. Anyone who lives on uh, TIFR campus, and we have a fair number of Bengalis on campus, will recognize alu poshto, and will recognize that that has khaskhas seeds, which could have traces of opium, small amounts, traces, but it, it, it can have traces of opium. Um, nutmeg, jaifal, you recognize that. You recognize bhang, which has been used in, uh, in India for, for a long time. Poppy seeds here on this pan also contains several substances which can be psychoactive, nicotine being the most obvious one, but in addition to nicotine, there are psychoactive substances. And um, 
bad cheese as in really high quality cheese which has gone blue is moving into the zone that it will have psychoactive substances so the idea that there are psychoactive substances is not very surprising this is my favorite psychoactive substance which, which is chocolate which also contains extremely interesting molecules that have potent effects on the brain so let's then go back to look at the history of psychedelics and psychedelics have been around as long as human beings have been eating things so we've been exploring the environment consuming things and inevitably have found things that made us feel good or perhaps made us feel different and so that's that's old history it's been around forever but what's the known history that we know where are the reports the earliest reports in a sense and can we sort of start looking at them so i'm going to zoom in across 12000 years and then bring us to present time to sort of discuss when do we know the earliest reported use and what do we know about what we call the prohibition era prohibition era is the last 100 years okay long before prohibition the earliest known prohibition is 1560 so we'll talk about that but really otherwise for more than thousands and thousands of years we've been using these and working with these molecules as human beings in different civilizations and societies so the earliest known history perhaps is is round about 10 to 12 and here's an example of 4000 bc so this is a cave painting and this is okay so if you think about 10000 years round about 10 to 12000 years back when you have agrarian societies where you have domestication of animals and you think about cave paintings that emerged around that era it would not be surprising to see a bull because there was a beginning of tilling of land etc but what you can also see are these spindly like objects at the bottom of this cave painting in spain which people conjecture are the psilocybin like mushroom of course this is conjecture because we can't ask and we don't have any other way of really interrogating this but this was a suspected idea and people have actually debated this quite a bit and wondered whether the consumption of substances was associated with the emergence of art very much conjecture and hand waving no real data until relatively recently this is an example of a medicine man 9000 bc algeria and what look like mushrooms in his hand and on his body and there has been suspected uh, evidence some of it archaeological anthropological which suggested that these substances were potentially used therapeutically by witch doctors or medicine men again we don't have documented evidence we have suspected reasons to believe that they were being utilized the strongest reason to suspect it is probably what showed up in art which looked like nothing that existed in real life so this is absolutely existent in real life to also solve images like this the fact that these images show up in cave art raises the possibility of altered perceptual states of people who were painting these and may be under the influence so again conjecture but an interesting conjecture nevertheless and that's interesting because if you see this this imagery shows up very often as a common image which is one face with a cyclops like i know that itself is interesting from a mythological perspective with the idea of cyclops showing up and where is this face with this one large eye here's an example of someone where we know there was consumption of a psychedelic substance this is 1938 and you can see the sort of imagery that shows up is remarkably similar to what you saw thousands of years ago again still very much hand waving conjecture interesting but you know makes for interesting conversation but certainly not proof so what do we have as proof like where is the actual proof for this potentially and what do we need to actually do to even have proof of things that happened more than you know several thousands of years ago this one is not that far back this is about 1300 ad is the suspected usage so this is a pinwheel cave which exists in california and the spinwheel cave has been around for a long time but this particular paper is used as one of the examples of potential proof for what is called the altered states of consciousness model this model and proponents of this model essentially say that the prehistoric making of cave paintings was actually linked or associated to the consumption of psychoactive substances obviously nobody had proof for this model but what Uh, yes so substances are available in those regions continued to be indigenously used but there's no way to say that 10000 years ago they were being used what we have is a closest for at least a few hundred years back right and this is this example so this is dated at around 1300 ad so it's much later but this is also associated with uh, these pinwheels showing up in this 
in the roof of this particular cave, which is called the Pinwheel Cave in California. And this pinwheel looks remarkably like the dhatura flower dried. And many of you would have seen the dhatura flower. It's this purple looking flower which exists all over India. And people would have told you don't eat it. Or I mean, I, I don't, my mistake do not end up, you know, this is toxic. It's highly poisonous. So you might have heard that as some grandparent telling you watch out, don't, you know, eat, consume dhatura. So what was known is that this looked like dhatura. Dhatura actually contains an extremely interesting psychoactive substance called scopolamine. So what they did next was actually quite nice. They looked at quids which look like tobacco pieces that have been taken out of the mouth and stuck to the top of the pinwheel roof cave. And when they pulled that out, they could look at the patterns that were there on those that suggested mastication because you can actually see the architecture would look like teeth marks which have chewed on this and then put it back up there. Following that, they did mass spec. And when they did that, they could identify scopolamine, terribly toxic substances like atropine. So there would have been also toxic substances in the mix, but they identified scopolamine. That was sort of the first confirmation of potential ingestion of hallucinogens at a rock art site. So this idea has been out there, but there hasn't been great proof of it. So let's go back to other examples that we know of where there might have been this sort of usage, right? So these are um, several civilizations and cultures all across Middle and South America, the Mayan civilization and the Incan civilization being the two most well-known examples. And if you look, for example, at this particular Aztec statue, it stands on top of things where there are mushroom-like objects in the year. There is morning glory, again, contains very potent psychoactive substances. And the idea that this is the Aztec god of flowers and dance, and it's associated with mushrooms and other entheogenic plants. And what are entheogens? These are psychoactive substances that induce alterations in perception, mood, consciousness, cognition, and behavior, with the view that they were used traditionally for spiritual development or in other sacred contexts. And entheos means to be possessed of or to come into being, to be possessed of God or to come into being. And here are the Mayan mushroom stones in Guatemala, again, very famous, very well known, again, suggestive of the fact that mushrooms were actually used in ceremonial usage going back now quite a while. So this is, this is actually fairly ancient. We know this, we know that ayahuasca tea has been used for centuries in the, by Amazonian tribes. And ayahuasca comes from the Quechua word for wine of the souls or wine of the dead. And it's actually quite interesting that even by random, if they were to mix two plants together, the chances of having mixed this in the Amazonian biodiversity is pretty low, given the number of species that are out there. And why am I saying this? That's because what happens when you make a cocktail of these plants is that dimethyltryptamine, which is abundant in the world, abundant in you and me, is a Schedule One substance, by the way. So we are all contraband. So we're carrying substantial amounts of DMT within our bodies, but it is illegal. It's a Schedule One banned drug, and it is it's it's present in all plants, present in us. But it doesn't give up each of us a psychoactive hallucinatory experience. It's because it's broken down in your gut by monoamine oxidase enzymes. So nothing gets to your brain. What happens is when you have this cocktail, you also have molecules like harmine and harmaline, which block the monoamine oxidase. So now when you have that DMT, you accumulate it enough that it gets into the brain and then you have the, the full experience of the um, psychoactive, psychedelic-like experience that happens. And this is what is actually drunk uh, and provided to initiates by shamans after they go through what's called a purification exercise. So it's interesting that these molecules have been around and used for a long, long time. There are, there's a set setting that means you have to have it with the shaman. There are songs that are you associated with it. So they're parts of ceremonial practices. I don't want you to walk away thinking they were only used in sort of South America or Middle America or Mexico, Incan civilizations, all mixed civilizations. It was also used in ancient Greece. And this is actually quite interesting. And here's Brian Murarescu has written extensive about this, extensively about this. So Eleusis is north of Athens. And it's actually a, a place where there, there is something called the Eleusinian Mysteries, which Socrates, by the way, Plato, etc., are supposed to have taken partaken of. And this is actually a cult which was to Persephone and Demeter. Persephone being the, in the myth, the one who was taken away by Hades to hell. 
and then had to be actually pulled back out. And that whole story is very interesting because Persephone is actually the goddess of vegetation and grain. Now, why am I saying this? Because one of the parts of the Ellisonian mis um, mysteries is the consumption of a drink that is derived from barley and grain and rye. Why is this important? Because all of these grains grow fungus on them. Like um, in our weather, pretty much everyone's bread is growing fungus on it. Much the same way, if you do not keep your grain stored appropriately, you're going to have fungus growing. And, and one of the funguses that grow on it is ergot. Ergot contains ergotamines and ergot alkaloids, which are very potent psychedelics. And so this is in his book. He describes it as it's really interesting that our relationship as, as a civilization with wheat, rye, grains, barley goes back about 12,000 to 13,000 years. It would be surprising that there was no infected grain and that infected grain did not enter the portions, creating visions. It would have been very surprising if that had not happened. And so then he describes this with reference to the fact that the Eleusinian mysteries, the great mysteries, are considered to be drinks that were derived from barley and rye. Initiates had to drink this special drink, and it was the discovery of fragments has already been made at Greek temples. And then in the dental calculus of a 25-year-old man, they found examples of a god having been consumed. So this is a very interesting space of archaeologists, cultural anthropologists, um, chemists, biologists coming together to potentially look at what the molecules might have been that have been consumed and that you can actually extract in terms of information centuries later through material that you now have access to. All right. So if the history is so old, what has happened now? Because, I mean, this has clearly been used. So this was used all through this window of time, through this part of the world, certainly in other parts of the world as well. I told you about Algeria, Spain right there, Greece. So it has been used world over. We have our own special sets of molecules that we have used in India. They don't classically fall into some of these group of molecules, but they are, they are similar and very interesting in terms of their psychoactive effects. The first big ban that we know of. Now we are in the era of bans. They've been banned since 1970. And this is a period in which these are considered illegal substances where obviously there's incarceration associated with usage or trafficking, right? So what's the earliest ban? The earliest ban is actually of the peyote ban. And the peyote ban happened in Mexico. This is directly associated with colonial invasions of these regions. Because the Spanish, through the intermediaries of the missionary, encountered peyote, and they vigorously opposed the practice, not so much on account of its physiological effects, but perceived religious significance. And they actually described eating peyote cactus as similar to eating flesh. So this was considered almost cannibalistic in a sense. And obviously, this was associated with the fact that consumption of these is thought to be part of pagan ceremonies. And it was a pushback against the church, which was really you know, expanding in both Mexico and South America at that point in time. This is the actual written text uh, from this particular paper by Aurelien Boyard, where he describes the translation of what was the first known ban, where he describes it as the inquisitors against heretical perverse, perversity and apostasy in the city of Mexico ban the use of peyote because they view it as opposed to the purity and integrity of the holy Catholic faith, and they actually view it as the work of the devil. Um, not surprising, given associated with the consumption of POT are hallucinations, altered states of consciousness, absolutely altered visions, and that would have been viewed as an opposition to the church. This one is one of the stories that comes back as one of the most interesting stories to think about in terms of how our history with psychoactive substances has been so laden with real major issues. So if you think about the Salem witch trials, the Salem witch trials is again in that similar era. So 1590 is the ban that happens in, in Mexico. 1691 is, this is, the, this is December 1691 in Salem, was a very, very wet um, fall period right before this. And the suspicion is that women, since this was patriarchal societies, women were the ones who were gathering the grain and making the bread. Maximum amount of concentrated exposure to the rye or the barley would have been for women. 
who would have made it and then baked it and then served it. The suspicion is that this, by the way, is the ergot fungus right here growing on rye. You can see it looks pretty similar. So women would have gathered sheaves of this, would have been exposed to ergotamines and ergot alkaloids, might have had absolute visions which would have involved fantastical creatures and changed states of consciousness which is how they ended up getting potentially labeled as witches and that was associated with them all being burnt at the stake but it's interesting how now you have cultural anthropologists going back and thinking about what might have potentially happened at that time yeah you had a question yeah no okay so, so I'll let me come back to that because these substances are actually not potently addictive. They don't hit the they don't hit the pathway that is associated with strong dependence. Not unlike cocaine or heroin or alcohol, any of the opiates or nicotine, which hit that pathway. This pathway, the pathways influenced by these molecules are very different. They do cause potent hallucinations. They are not necessarily strongly addictive or dependence induced. Yeah? Okay. So just if you look at this particular review, you will see a sense of the kind of molecules that have been taken from plant-derived uses. So hallucinogens, stimulants, anxiolytics, antidepressants, sedatives, analgesics, or aphrodisiacs have been used across multiple societies to a different extent over time. And if you obviously what stands out is this, which is hallucinogens in Native American societies, the substantial component of usage in that part of the world for these sets of molecules. So then what happened? If they were used for thousands and thousands of years, what suddenly changed? Well, the Western world discovered them because they were happily otherwise stuck wherever they were in their indigenous societies being used fairly responsibly because they were used in practices that were largely restricted. Even bhang consumption in India, if you think about it, has been largely restricted to the usage during specific festivals or specific events, not as global large-scale usage where it gets abused. So that sort of usage didn't even happen with these molecules, but something changed in the last 100 years, which resulted in the prohibition era. So what was going on then? And can we look at that modern history a little bit, just to tell you what these molecules are? I will be using some terms interchangeably. I will use the word psychedelic, which is a pan large word that encompasses all molecules that alter states of consciousness. I might use serotonergic psychedelics, which refers to molecules that hit the serotonin receptor and have specific actions at a specific receptor. That's why they're called serotonergic psychedelics. Mescaline, LSD, psilocybin, the molecule we work on in my lab, DOI, DMT, which is naturally present in all of us are all serotonergic psychedelics. Okay? So let's, let's dive into a relatively more recent history. We've gone through that old history. Let's look at what's going on currently, at least in the last 100 years and then in the last 10 or 15 years. Just to give you a sense, there are naturally derived psychedelic substances and there are synthesized psych psychedelic substances. So ayahuasca, DMT, mescaline, ibogaine, and psilocybin are all naturally derived. LSD was inspired from ergot alkaloids and is a synthesized molecule. MDMA, also a street drug called ecstasy, is not a classical serotonergic psychedelic, but is also a psychedelic. And ketamine is not a serotonergic psychedelic, but is a synthetic psychedelic, originally used as an anesthetic, but also used as a party drug, and now used as a potent, fast-acting antidepressant. Okay. So what's the history over the last 120, 130 years or so? So the earliest reports come with the isolation of mescaline by Arthur Hefter. And then following that, the big event is this event, which is the synthesis of LSD by Albert Hoffman. And this particular event is marked as the major event in which the awareness of psychedelics emerged in a major way in the Western world. So what was going on? So Hoffman was a chemist at Sandoz. And keep in mind, this is post World War I, World War II is going to be emerging in that window of time. There is a desire to generate antibiotics. Keep in mind also that penicillin came from fungus. So the idea of using fungus to generate molecules which might help to treat a variety of, of disorders is not very surprising. So he was trying to make an antibiotic from an ergot fungus. And instead, he synthesized LSD, which did not kill any bacteria, 
So it was a very useless antibiotic and it ended up on his shelf. So in 1938, he synthesizes LSD. It sits on his shelf till 1942 or 1943. When for whatever reason he decides he's going to try it. Um, this is not unheard of in that window and that era because people did try, several people tried what they synthesized. So he said, I'm going to start with a really small dose of LSD and try it. What he didn't realize is LSD is highly potent, lipophilic, and you need a very small amount of it to have a full-fledged psychedelic-like trip. So he didn't take a small amount. He took a substantial amount, thought he was dying because his entire universe changed and he had a major psychedelic-like experience. And so he asked his assistant to take him back on a cycle. So that is actually now commemorated as the bicycle day because that was the day he went back home. And then he sat down and kept tab of everything that happened to him. So he wrote it down or he dictated it. So this is the first reported history we have where there is a narrative record of what he went through on that particular day. So this was what he was. Uh, yeah. So this event was a major event. Following that, there was the awareness that these molecules actually look remarkably like serotonin and resulted in the first set of papers where he described that serotonin may be a major regulator of mood. If this is what it can do to your state of mind, maybe serotonin itself is capable of changing mood. It opened up the entire field of neuropsychopharmacology on serotonin post that discovery. It started with LSD and then went into serotonin. People were very interested in this molecule. There was a synthesis of ketamine that happened, but then 1960s happens and LSD appears on the streets. Uh, keep in mind, this is also going to be the time of the Vietnam War. So it is rather interesting how these two major events are colliding. One is the emergence of a chemical molecule on the streets. The other is the war machine in America being sort of driven up at that period of time. Yeah. It's also interesting that those two will clash because one of the common, one of the common things that is seen with the consumption of these molecules is a significant, they are also called empathogens in that they increase empathy. Likelihood of being able to generate um, aggressive drive towards wiping out someone who is essentially fighting for an imaginary line in the soil is a little unlikely when the person is under the influence of these psychedelics. So that these two are at conflict with each other. So if you see, you'll see drop acid, not bombs, love, not war. This is associated with the hippie culture of the 60s, hate Ashbury, that entire window. It's not surprising that the war machine wanted to clamp down on this as fast as is possible because it, would, it was really a major threat in a sense to the idea of what was happening at that point in time associated with um, Vietnam. I love this quote from Michael Pollan, so I'm just going to read it out to you. Michael Pollan is, has written extensively on psychedelics, but also has written extensively on the history of psychedelics. And those of you who um, would like to read the book, please do read it. And those of you who would much prefer the Netflix version, it's a four episode show on Netflix, well worth watching. Certainly interesting because it covers much of this history and what happened. And so it's, it's four episodes, well made, worth watching. So here's what he writes, and I would like to quote. So midway through the 20th century, two unusual molecules, and he talks about LSD and psilocybin, organic compounds with a striking family resemblance exploded upon the West. So I just want you to remember that psilocybin was around for thousands of years before that. And obviously thousands of years and people were aware of it and were already using it. LSD was synthesized only in 1938. So that certainly really exploded on the West based on ideas like psilocybin or ergot alkaloids. In time, they would change the course of social, political, and cultural history, as well as the personal histories of the millions of people who would eventually introduce them to their brains. As it happened, the arrival of these disruptive chemistries co coincided with another world historical explosion, that of the atomic bomb. There were people who compared the two events and made much of the cosmic synchronicity. Extraordinary new energies had been loosened upon the world. Things would never quite be the same. In a sense, it's interesting because this got banned and this didn't. Right? So if you have to say mushroom emerging on the world, the one that got completely banned is the one that was the biggest threat in a sense to this idea because this, so it's, it's interesting because many of you will probably watch Oppenheimer over this weekend or perhaps soon. And it's interesting to think about how these historical events scientifically and also in the real world were going on at the same time. So this gets banned. Okay? And that is the big event that happens. You have the banning of this in 1971, they are all put as Schedule 1 drugs. 
LSD is a Schedule 1 drug, psilocybine, mescaline, DMT. So they're all listed as Schedule 1. They are officially banned drugs of abuse. What happened associated with that is the interest in research also, because you couldn't access these molecules, went plummeting down. You just couldn't access them. The number of labs that could study it dropped drastically. And so what had been building as an area of research completely went into shutdown mode and very steeply went into shutdown. What do these molecules actually do? So these are the reported effects in humans. They're associated with ego dissolution in the sense that you do not feel a separation between yourself and inanimate objects in your environment. Mystical experiences have been reported. They're associated with altered perception and hallucinations. And one of the things that they do is they reduce default mode network activity. So what's the default mode network? Some of you here in this room are paying attention to me, hopefully and not thinking about the fact that there's a lot of rain outside and you have to actually navigate that to possibly get home. So if you're listening to me, you are not in default mode network activity. You are actually paying attention. You are, you're not. So your DMN is a little bit at rest. However, if you're ruminating about how terrible it is that your uh, you know, thesis isn't finished yet or your advisor is giving you a hard time or things are really not pleasant or that I have to move out of the hostel, what is going on? Hopefully there's no leakage in my lab. And you're thinking about it in a self-referential manner, your DMN is active. So your DMN is active and you're thinking largely in a self-referential mode. So this is your DMN and your DMN, unfortunately, tends to be significantly higher in individuals who have anxiety and depression. Not so surprising given these are ruminative disorders that are associated with self-referential thought. So DMN network activity is reduced by serotonergic psychedelics and it allows you to reset in a sense to take you, yourself out of a ruminative thought process. We also know that all serotonergic psychedelics hit this receptor and this is a receptor I've worked in since I was a, on worked on since I was a graduate student. So that's one of my interests in serotonergic psychedelics, the serotonin 2A receptor. Okay. So we know psychedelics do many interesting things to the brain. Look at the this is, these are PubMed searches carried out for publications just searching for the term dimethyltryptamine, ayahuasca, LSD, psilocybin, DOI, which I work on. But what you should be able to see is there was interest. There was interest and then something happens, right? Ayahuasca, nobody was studying because it was too complex and they weren't making it or brewing it in, in the US. Psilocybin, there was a little interest. There was much more interest in LSD. But then there's this lull period where nothing is happening and then suddenly something is happening here. And this is the re-emergence or renewal of interest in these molecules. And they are now amongst the most intensely studied molecules in the world. This is a, a molecule that I worked on. It's, it's a synthetic molecule, which is not schedule one, which is how I can work on it at, in TIFR. Because otherwise, to get narcotics clearance to import any of these molecules, you can just forget. It's not going to be straightforward to get them. DOI is also a potent serotonergic psychedelic, but it's not a Schedule One drug. Okay. So what, what led to the resurgence of interest? Why did people who had put it all on the shelf in 1970 even say that maybe these molecules are worth looking at? Maybe they're worth thinking about again from a, a therapeutic perspective. It started with a breakthrough therapy status being given to MDMA which is also known as ecstasy. It started because um, a bunch of clinicians decided to seek permission to give it to individuals who had end-of-life diagnosis for cancer, terminal cancer. So the ability to get permission to try something who had for individuals who are anyway terminally ill are in hospices or in hospice-like setting where they have severe anxiety and depression because of an end-of-life diagnosis was possible. So FDA allowed the clinical trial to go ahead. And they had remarkable effects. It's rare to get remarkable effects with molecules for anxiety and depression. In the context of people with an end-of-life diagnosis, it would be even harder. But they did notice a, a pretty dramatic and beneficial effect. And as a consequence, it got breakthrough th therapy status to be used for terminal cases to tackle that end-of-life diagnosis. From there, it went on to be used for post-traumatic stress disorder in veterans clinics, where it again had very interesting effects, and then went on to be used for many other things where it, so this is just summarizing across a period of time, fact that there were so many trials, this is, this is going to about a couple of years back. And what are the trials for? 
depression, anxiety, substance abuse, by the way, one of the most potent treatments for opiate and cocaine abuse, because unlike those drugs, this allows you to set shift such that you might take yourself off dependence of other drugs of abuse. Um, pain, sleep disorder, trauma, a variety of disorders. And there are different molecules are representing to a different extent the trials that are being done. And there are several, several trials that are active. Just to give you a sense of why this will even matter, this is the share of the population with mental health disorders in 2019. So you can actually see that there's a, this has gone up over a period of time. And this is a substantial load with epidemiological data that we have. And we have missing data from much part, many parts of the world. Even the data from India is not very complete across all socioeconomic strata. This is just a sense of the number of interventional clinical trials that have been done. Substantial, several and going up. Australia just legalized uh, potential use for therapeutic usage, and that is coming. But India hasn't done a clinical trial yet. They are scheduled one drugs in India, and we haven't had a clinical trial in India yet. Ketamine is used in India and Nimhans in particular. But other than that, there really hasn't been any psychedelic that has been used for therapy in the Indian context. Whatever is used in India is used off the street, okay? It's not, uh, it's a, which is very, very scary because you have no clue about what that cocktail contains. It could be N number of molecules that has just been consumed. So, yeah. So these molecules are interesting. So here, here are the tryptamines, the dimethyltryptamine being one of them. These are ergolines. These are the phenyl ethylamines. These are the class of molecules that we use in our lab. And these are dissociatives that don't fall into the serotonergic class. All of these, hit this particular G protein coupled receptor in the brain. Also hit it elsewhere in the body because it's in other parts of the body as well. So what do we do in our lab? I'll just touch upon that briefly and give you a sense of some of the things that we have been looking at. We are interested in studying drugs that modulate circuits that produce emotional responses using a variety of approaches, very molecular approaches, more circuit based approaches, um, ways to understand what they do to cellular function and also what they do to architecture of the brain across a period of time. I'm going to touch on some data between these two projects so that I can give you a little bit of a sense of what we are doing. So this is work from a senior graduate student in the lab, Toshali Banerjee, started off originally by Antara. But just to give you a sense of what we are doing, we have a variety of molecules. DOI, TCB2, NBOM, all serotonergic psychedelics, all not Schedule 1, but all very potent serotonergic psychedelics. Here is an interesting molecule derived from Indian traditional medicine, from Berberis vulgaris. Berberine is a molecule that is an isoquinoline alkaloid, becomes quite interesting because it may potentially have similar effects. So we are interested in looking at indigenous plants, even within the Indian context, that might have been used for things, some of these some of these kinds of effects. And what do we do? We can look at them at neurons in a dish. We can look at them at neurons either in the rat brain or in the mouse brain. The power of the mouse is that we have all the genetics. The power of the rat is it's larger, behavior is more easy to do, and you can do a variety of circuit level studies in, uh, in rats. But we'd love to also ask whether the effects we see in rodents, either in culture or in the whole animal, are recapitulated to some extent in humans. So can we look at human neurons? We can't look at human beings, but can we look at human neurons? So you can take fibroblasts from human beings, convert them into induced pluripotent stem cells, and then make those into neurons and actually look at that. And that's what we are doing in collaboration with NIMHANS. And we're interested, obviously, in studying this at multiple levels. The hardest problem in neuroscience is the ability to jump across levels. We are able to study them fairly decently at each level, but to be able to translate information at the cellular level into meaningful function at the network level becomes a challenge, or from the network level to a eventual emergent behavior. So these are the challenges that exist for the field per se, and that's also a challenge that we face. So here's what Toshali decided to do. Toshali decided to look at this particular behavior um, this particular response, which is a head twitch and hallucinatory response. And she was interested in lipid signaling that happens downstream of this particular psychedelic DOI. So let me explain this. DOI is known to be a potent serotonergic psychedelic. It hits the 5-HT2A receptor. All psychedelics, how do we study psychedelics in rats and mice? We cannot ask them, did you hallucinate? That is not an available option for us. So that is, unfortunately, wipes out the ability to look at perception very easily. 
What we can do is look at proxy behaviors that happen in rodents that happen with all psychedelics and do not happen with non-psychedelics. So one of those behaviors is encapsulated here. It's the easiest behavior to score. You can take a high school student and make them just look at animals and count out the behavior. It's pretty straightforward. So if you take a look at the behavior, you'll see it here in this video. You'll see the rat and you should see a head twitch. Yeah, did you see that? It just look, it's just as simple as that. So animals will hit twitch in any case normally. If you put water on them, they will twitch even more. You would have seen this with a dog because it shows a very typical wet dog shake or shakes its head to knock off the water. Animals that are given psychedelics show many more head twitches than you would expect in animals that do not have a psychedelic. And that's what that's been seen repeatedly. And we know it's mediated through this receptor. This work from Javier Gonzalez Mice. So here are the number of head twitches within a period of 20 minutes. Here's DOI, DOM, DOB, mescaline, LSD, psilocybin, non-psychedelics. And the sign next to it, minus, minus, is a mouse that lacks the 5-HT2A receptor. Don't have the receptor, don't get this response. So you need this receptor to actually get this particular response. And what Toshali quantitated here is just examples of the same thing. This is well known. We're just reconfirming it. You can see that DOI and NBOM evoke clear increases in head twitch behavior. Which what she and Antara wanted to ask next built on questions that remain a perplexing problem for most neurobiologists and especially those who are interested in how these drugs work. Look. In your and my body, there aren't serotonergic psychedelics floating around. We have serotonin, which is the natural ligand. And we are not undergoing a hallucinatory experience ongoing at normal times, other than if you have schizophrenia, in which case you might be. And in fact, one of the receptors involved in that is the 5-HT2A receptor. So how is it that drugs like DOI, which is a psychedelic, produce hallucinations and produce this head twitch response? But drugs like lyceride, which hit the same receptor, do none of that. So you have two drugs, similar binding pocket, similar affinities, and they don't produce similar effects at all. So there has to be something that is different in the response they evoke. People have been looking to find, they've been crystallized, there's an idea of the binding pockets, but nothing so drastically different to explain how you end up with such differing responses. So one of the things Antara and the lab had done a little while back was to look at whether the signaling responses. So eventually, once an external signal binds to a receptor, it produces a plethora of downstream biochemical changes. And you can measure those over a period of time. And what we noticed is that while the changes were similar, the magnitude was very different and the duration for which they persisted was significantly more with the psychedelic at the same dose with a similar affinity which you did not see with drugs like lyceride. And that's just shown by the magnitude in this particular cartoon, which summarizes a substantial amount of data. So we know that the first event is actually the activation of a phospholipase, which then breaks down PIP2. And PIP2 hydrolysis will give you a bunch of downstream molecules. Several of these are lipid moieties. They then go on to produce a variety of changes. So we were interested in looking at lipid signaling signatures. And this is where Toshali comes in. And Toshali, in collaboration with Sidesh Kamat's lab, so that's Sidesh. So this entire project is done together with Sidesh's lab at ISA Pune. So we are co uh, doing teams together that actually have attempted to solve this. So what we've, we've done is we've looked in vitro first and then in vivo. So you can take neurons, take them out of the rat or a mouse, and then grow them in a dish. And once you do that, you can treat them with DOI or lyceride and ask if in one hour later, if you simply look at agnostically all the lipid signatures there are, is there a way to pick up differences in the kind of lipids that you see? And what is obvious is yes, you can see differences. And that's obvious right here. This is diacylglycerol, which I already showed you, we knew was going to be elevated significantly more. But there are other interesting molecules that show up. And that's what I want to talk about today. This is just the cell pellet, which would be in the cells. This is the medium, so secreted by the neurons. It still doesn't tell you it's happening in the brain. That was in a dish. So that's neurons in a dish. Here you can take a rat. You can treat it with DOI lyceride, flash freeze the brain, get it to Pune, do mass spec, and ask whether you see similar signatures. And what you actually do see is that, yes, much of what you see in a dish is also recapitulated in the whole brain. And the molecule that I want you to pay attention to is right here, this molecule. This moved a little bit, but this is what you, this is 2 arachnoid glycerol. That's an endocannabinoid, okay? Your body produces endocannabinoids. The cannabinoid you would be most aware of is marijuana. 
which is an external cannabinoid. Your body obviously makes your its own cannabinoids, and this is a potent endocannabinoid, much more potent than anandamide, which is another endocannabinoid, and about thousand times more potent in terms of its affinity to the cannabinoid receptor. So then Toshali went on to ask, okay, this is interesting. Does this happen with only DOI? Is it some random thing that's happening with one psychedelic or is it happening with other psychedelics? And what she was able to show is three different psychedelics, all phenylethanamines, DOI, TCB2 and N-bomb, all increase to AG. They don't increase anandamide. They produce arachidonic acid, which is a downstream uh, molecule, lipid signaling molecule further down. So this is 2-AG on the side. So now we're getting interested in this. And then we wanted to ask, okay, if this is true, do we know that this is all mediated through the 2-A receptor? Or is there some random thing these molecules are doing, which is also increasing endocannabinoid signal? We know it's mediated through this receptor because in, we can check this pharmacologically and genetically. You take rats. These are several rats that are taken. Obviously, there's a control group, which just gets vehicle. There's a group that gets a blocker for the 5-HT2-A receptor. There's a group that gets the psychedelic and there's a combination treatment. So your attempt is to ask whether the behavior induced by the psychedelic is gone. Well, this is an old hat. Everybody already knew this. So there's nothing new that we've done here. You just block the two-way receptor. You absolutely block this head twitch response. But what is new is this, which is that you need the two-way receptor be, to be stimulated to get the endocannabinoid pathway kicked in. You need the receptor. That's how the endocannabinoid signaling goes up. And that's attenuated significantly when you block the receptor. You can also show this genetically. And one way to do this is to just knock out the receptor. So now these are mice and they survive absolutely fine without the receptor as well. So you have wild type mice and knockout mice. These are the behaviors. What's obvious is that the behavior induced by the drug is gone if you don't have the receptor. If the receptor is knocked out, you come in with the drug, you don't get the behavior. That is also true when it comes to the endocannabinoid signaling. Here's the increase in the signaling associated with the drug. And when you knock out the receptor, you get rid of this particular signaling signature. So what Toshali then went on to show, and I'll just summarize this data, is that DOI through the 5-HT2A receptor, unlike lyceride and unlike serotonin, and unlike non-psychedelics, is recruiting a pathway that allows DAG to be broken down to give you 2-AG. 2-AG is the potent endocannabinoid. So there's a step here that is, is downstream. And how is this happening? There's two ways it could happen. DAG gets broken down to 2-AG by the DAG lipase. And 2-AG gets broken down by MAGL to give you arachidonic acid. Either you increase the activity of this enzyme or you block or reduce the activity of this enzyme such that 2-AG accumulates in the brain when you have a psychedelic on board. What uh, we showed along with Siddhesh's lab is that the DAGL activity is significantly increased, but MAGL activity is not affected at all. And why is this interesting? It's interesting because it allows us to start teasing out signatures of molecules downstream of psychedelics, which are unique to psychedelics and not seen with other drugs that hit the very same receptor. Where we were able to show that through this pathway, 2-AG is actually contributing to the head twitch response. We blocked this enzyme, prevented 2-AG from being made. And this is work done by um, Toshali and BG in the lab. And what we know is that if you block either this enzyme or block this receptor, you block the head twitch response. So one hallucinogenic signature, which you see in rats and in mice, gets blocked by blocking the production of 2-AG but not another behavior. Again, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip that. But antidepressant-like responses evoked by this drug do not involve this pathway. So that's another path. Clearly doesn't go via this pathway at all. But this is all rat and this is all mouse. So does this happen in human? That's a natural question. So this is work which we've done with Biju, Sali, Lekhan, Shandritika at Nimhans. What they've done is they have grown neurons from humans, healthy volunteers who have given their fibroblast skin cells, which can be converted into induced pluripotent stem cells. And then over a process, you can make them into cortical neurons. When you make them into neurons, you want to check that they express the receptor, which they do indeed. And when you apply drugs like DOI, you get a nice increase in 2-AG levels. So human neurons are also responding similarly. This experiment has taken us five years to do, which is why we are just beyond proud of it. Partly because to get this drug, this is psilocybin. 
a schedule one drug. Initially, when I started my career at TIFR, I realized that the Narcotics Bureau is in Lucknow. And this is like Vagle ki dunya on steroids. Because if you call this person up and you say, I would like to import LSD, psilocybin, etc. for research purposes. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> Oops, I forgot about that. Sorry. I forgot about that. Thank you. But it is true. It is exactly what it was. So I gave up. I decided this was pointless and many hours and would be wasted actually talking to this human being in, in Lucknow. So we worked with DOI, uh, TCP2, NBOM. But the interesting experiments are with LSD and psilocybin because these are the clinically used molecules. How do we actually show that work with these clinically relevant? So five years ago, Lekhanj, Biju and I started chatting about this saying, can we get this to Nimhans? At least Nimhans gets the permission to get it. It took five years to get the permission. But this is also important because these are completely different classes of molecules. These are phenylethylamines, these are tryptamines. So it's also important to show it goes across classes and goes to a clinically relevant molecule like psilocybin. And yes, this is fresh off the, literally fresh off the last few months that we now know that this is also a target for psilocybin. This is interesting because it tells you that you are through the psychedelics, you're speaking to an endogenous cannabinoid signaling cascade, an endocannabinoid pathway, which then can have many potent and interesting effects. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip the rest just to tell you that where we will be going with this, we've done everything in healthy volunteers. So we've done nothing with patient-derived neurons, and that's a direction that we will 100% take next. I'm going to skip this other stuff. I'll just skip this. Um, yeah, so the lab works on lipid signaling signatures. We try to dissect circuits that actually mediate the, the neurons within the microcircuit and the across circuit um, connections that drive specific behaviors. We look at cellular changes and plasticity. And none of this is possible without an amazing team. So I just added Shudipto into it. So Shudipto doesn't have a mushroom next to him. This is Angarika's contribution to the kind of mushrooms that, I mean, yeah, well, this is a toadstool. It's not a mushroom, doesn't produce any serotonergic psychedelics, but I want to acknowledge all the people in the lab that, um, you know, work on this. Uh, I talked today largely about Toshali's data and BG works along with her. And so they are wrapping up the story along with Siddhesh, who's our collaborator and Biju in, uh, in Nimhans. The rest of the work I didn't get a chance to talk about at all, but Alex, my collaborator at Cornell, where we are looking at circuits, and that's work led by Prachi, and then Sashayana, Astha, and others in the lab working on mitochondria. Uh, I think the patron saint of all uh, the people who work on serotonergic psychedelics is Yoda, probably most appropriate. So yeah, that's it, and uh, I will stop and take questions. Thank you for telling me I'm on YouTube. That will stay permanently on YouTube or no? Okay. Maybe we can leap it out. Yeah. So fantastic talk as usual and what is expected uh, from Vidita. And I'm sure there are quite a few uh, questions. So I will leave this mic off this side. Uh, hi. Uh, wonderful talk. Uh, so, uh, so you had mentioned uh, schizophrenia a couple of times. So I think there is maybe a quote from a Michael Pollan interview or some something where he says that a lot of these drugs like MDMA and psilocybin, which have been used for uh, PTSD and stuff, um, the analogy he gave was that they shake up the snow globe of the brain. Uh, whereas, uh, so this is in behaviors which seem to be like rigid behaviors that are stuck in like um, in trauma and depression and so on. Uh, but in schizophrenia or something something like schizophrenia where it seems like there's already a lot of chaos in the brain, these things do not seem to help. Or I'm not sure what's the known thing here. So uh, could you just comment on what do we know about this uh, different sort of uh, issues yeah. in schizophrenia? So one of the things that all psychedelics do is they increase network activity across multiple circuits simultaneously in cortical brain regions. And so, yes, they help with PTSD, they help with depression, they help with anxiety, substance abuse, but they're strongly contraindicated for both bipolar disorder, which has mania, 
and schizophrenia because they can induce a full-fledged psychotic episode. And that is something that people even look at in clinical trials. If someone comes in with a family history of either manic depression or a relative with schizophrenia, even a far relative, they will be contraindicated for even a trial as a volunteer because of the risk that the altered sense of perception is only one step away from a full-fledged psychotic episode and a hallucination. So bad trips or the ability to induce a full-fledged psychosis is the one big worry with these molecules. They are very, very, very potent. In fact, if you say there's a holy grail in neuroscience, the holy grail is consciousness. And it's been the hardest and the most impossible for the field to study. These are molecules that directly alter states of consciousness. So from a pharmacological perspective, they're a very powerful tool to interrogate circuits that drive a conscious state or a conscious experience. But yes, they are contraindicated because of that component. There's been a heavy debate about whether that altered state of perception is needed for the mood effects or not. And the jury is out on that. People are not clear about that at all. But there are people who are working on molecules that don't cause the hallucinations, but improve the mood effects. So that's a debate. It's controversial. No one is, uh, you know, there are people in two camps on that. One of the things we find and is that the circuit that regulates anxiety is utterly different from the circuit that produces the hallucinatory behavior. Ventral hippocampus, PV neurons in the ventral hippocampus being targeted for that. This is cortical. So it's very different circuits which points to the possibility that different circuits will mediate effects on different domains of behavior, not very surprising. But there is the, is the jury is out on whether you need the perceptual shift. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you for the nice talk. Uh, so this is connected to the work in your lab, which you mentioned towards the end. Um, so one question is, uh, is, is the next steps or so where it's leading to also connected with some kind of uh, 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 medicines for treatment. Uh, and second is, uh, so you, you, you said it took you five years to get the permission. Um, why was this not done elsewhere in the world or what is unique which, which you guys had which allowed you to do this or, or hold on to it? So, um, just on that office, I think my phone. Um, so, Okay, um, where are we going with this? We'll go both deeply preclinical because we're interested in the circuit level mechanisms. For example, with the anxiety, we have an idea of which populations of neurons drive the behavior. In the absence of the drug, if you tweak the circuit, you can modulate the behavior. We're interested in also understanding the underpinnings. We can use the drugs as a tool to understand the circuitry. So that's one angle. There's obviously another angle which is clinically oriented for which we need clinical collaborators. I mean, nothing we do is directly going to go to the clinic, but in collaboration with Biju, we are interested in asking whether all these lipid signatures, for example, or even the mitochondrial changes are different when we take cells from patients with a history of depression, or we take cells from patients who are completely healthy volunteers, or from patients who have schizophrenia, because you expect two way signaling to be altered in that case. Now, the quest, the problem with some of this is that you are expecting the changes that are there in the brain to stay in these induced pluripotent stem cells and in these neurons in a dish. That's a bit of a leap of faith. There are some signatures that appear to be from literature conserved. Some of them are obviously not always maintained in a, in a, in a dish. You lose things in a dish, which you, you get in the complexity of the nervous system. So that's one problem. Why did we, okay, so how did we have a lead here? People have been working with psilocybin and LSD everywhere else in the world. So it's not as though, you know, I mean, DOI is what we worked on. And we had a bit of a lead because we stumbled on some things. We stumbled on two findings. One, we stumbled on the fact that serotonin, through the 5-HT2A receptor and psychedelics boost mitochondria. They produce many more mitochondria and cortical neurons and you increase the efficiency of mitochondria. So it's like driving up efficiency in a power plant for the cell, which has important implications for buffering stress, et cetera. We just stumbled on this. We stumbled on it a little earlier than people. So we have a window of time in which we will, that window of time is shortly shrinking. It's going to go because it's already published. So that, that's one, one niche we have. The other niche is this collaboration that we had with Siddhesh, which has not gotten published yet. Toshali is writing the paper. Once that's out, I anticipate there will be many other people who are equally interested in looking at lipid signaling. 
the idea of lipid signaling is not unique so we are in a competitive field where you know and which is good because if i was doing something that nobody else was interested in, in the world it may not be such a great thing so in a sense we will be also part of a community of people who are going to be asking the same questions we will be hamstrung by our access to lsd and silosabin and ayahuasca but we'd be able to do everything with doi tcb2 and nbom providing perhaps those are cleaner drugs in any case. They have much cleaner efficiency and efficacy for the 5-HT2A receptors. We'll provide one. We will lose some information in the process. But yeah, that's just part of the game, I guess. Hello? Yeah. So you pointed out that the serotonergic circuit is connected to the cannabinoid. I mean, in some way. Yeah. Uh, so the serotonergic signaling, signaling pathway, pathway is connected eventually to recruiting cannabinoid receptors. And the head twitch response is because of the cannabinoids? Well, it looks like at least it's a component of it because you can block it by blocking uh, the DAG lipase. You don't allow 2AG to be made. You get an attenuation in the head twitch. You block the cannabinoid receptor, you get an attenuation in the head twitch. There, is, there are older reports where people have done knockouts with the cannabinoid 1 receptor, which suggests that the head twitch is also altered. So that idea that the endocannabinoid pathway is right there has been around, but it hasn't been shown in this manner. So is it, I have two questions, is it that the head twitch response, which you are characterizing as a mm -hmm. hallucinogen for serotonergic psychedelics, is it actually a serotonergic response? And, uh, I mean, uh, it is because you don't get it if you don't have the 5-HT2A receptor. It's initiated first by the 2A receptor. Without the 2A receptor, you won't get the response at all. You knock out the receptor, block the receptor, everything downstream. We have four steps removed to get the cannabinoid signaling. You have to hit the receptor, activate PLC, then go down, make DAG. DAG gets converted into 2AG and then you get the effect. So that's, yeah, but without the 2A, you don't start anything. And the second part is... Um... How is then this pathway not an in the addiction circuit and the cannabinoid yeah. pathway? Isn't it? Cannabinoids are also not addictive. So okay. let me tell you the reality of the fact that it, they are not addictive. I mean, they are relatively on the scale of, okay, harm to humans, potential for drug dependence. Number one on that list, actually harm to humans and, and potential for drug abuse is alcohol right at the top. But it has a large lobby. Very different. It's a, this is this moves into spaces of policy, what you do with it, harm to human beings. Harm to human beings in terms of alcohol is substantially higher because of the likelihood that you can also take out other people along the way. Because of the fact that drunk driving is actually one major cause of, of loss of life. So actually in terms of accidents evoked, it, it, can, it tends to be high. Nicotine in terms of harm to human beings, well, not to others, but certainly to yourself is high because of the tar associated with it. Though nicotine can also have some interesting other effects. Cocaine, opiates, right at the top of that list. So they are right there on that list. Drugs like PCP on that list. On the list, lower down are things like cannabis, and because they, the cannabinoid receptors and the cannabinoid signaling pathway does not hijack the ventral tegmental area to accumbent circuitry, which is the drug dependent circuitry, which is targeted by many other drugs. So relatively drug dependence is unlikely. Certain physiological strong dependence doesn't happen. People may like the way they feel on the drug and continue to consume. But it's not because of, of strong drug dependence because of the pathway being high. That is true for all serotonergic psychedelics, also true for cannabis and then yeah, marijuana. There is a question from Zoom. So do you think all uh, different psychedelics have the same mechanism of high? No, not at all. Um, the ones I talked about, DOI, TCB2, and NBOM, are cleaner drugs for their affinity to the 5-HT2A receptor. LSD has broader affinity. It's the serotonin 1A receptor, hits some of the dopamine receptors. So drugs that have, some of these drugs have broader uh, targets that they hit. So yeah, not at all. It's not a given that, and they're also their drug availability in the body and the way your body metabolizes them can be very different. There are some drugs that last for four days in your body. And some that last for 20 minutes. So, yeah, no, it's absolutely not. Yeah. No, I just want to get a picture. So, how many mice are you using in your lab? How does that process work? 
And then what kind of statistical analysis do you do to kind of validate your consistency? So, so we use, for behaviors, we usually use 10 to 15 animals per group. And, um, you know, for, for mass spec, it would be about six to seven per group. And then you repeat the experiment. That's a single N, capital N of one with like four to six per group or 10 to 15 per group, depending on what your readout is. Behavior tends to have higher degree of variation than the biochemical signatures. Biochemical signatures tend to be much tighter. You, the power calculations will allow you to get away with, with lesser number of animals. You usually do capital Ns of two or three, which is you repeat that whole experiment again once and one more time. So you have at least three repeats of the experiment to be certain. And then we also do it double blind, as in the, the other end doesn't know what the groups are. So we are they're all just jumbled up. And then it's for example, when we're doing the mass spec, they're just labeled one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then we break the code after we've done it. And usually there are things like ANOVAs or two-way ANOVAs when we're looking at two variables interacting. If it's just two groups, it's a T test. If it's parametric in its distribution, otherwise we use non-parametric to sort of look at. Where do you get the mice from? So we have an, our own animal house and right there is our wonderfully talented vet who runs our entire facility. So yeah, <laughs> so yeah we, we breed our own mice. And for the knockouts, our knockouts come from all over the world. We have a, we have a bunch of them coming to Cornell from a, for a couple of weeks, hopefully. So we will have animals which are, if there's a genetic mutation, we will have them from wherever they've been made in the world. They have to get imported. And they go to quarantine and then they are in the they expand. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I just wanted to ask like uh the way the drug is taken, so like injected or orally, how does that affect the feeling of the drug? And the reason I asked this is because you spoke about the witch trials and how a lot of the women were like possibly experiencing these effects, but were they, like, were they ingesting these or were they just around them? And if so, that's a great question because mode of administration matters. LSD is a lipid and very, very lipophilic. So in the street parlance, it's usually on a blotting paper, which is put on the tongue and it, it also will cross through skin. So it's actually very low doses are required. So that's highly lipophilic one. Many of them are highly lipophilic. We're doing these interesting experiments now with Shudipto's lab where they are looking at their membrane modulating properties. So some of them can be directly just absorbed. Many of them are ingested. Some of them are injected. Dimethyltryptamine, in fact, the first time they made a discovery that it was a psychedelic was when it was injected because if you orally consumed it, you got digested and never made it. Again. So the, only, the first time it was actually figured out it's a potent psychedelic was when it went intravenous. So yeah, there are different modes of administration and mode of administration matters. Okay, so that I think once again, that is fine. I also want to take a minute to thank the advertise uh, next week that uh, today onwards uh, we have quite a few additional uh, colloquia happening one on Monday and one on Wednesday uh, so uh, Monday is by uh, Professor Yoshi Mr. Yoshi and on Wednesday, it is by Nava Wonders. Of course, we have a regular colloquium next Friday by Arun Grover. So, um, all this information is there uh, on the campus and posted. Uh, so, there are two additional special colloquia next week. So, it's all raining assets. Thank you very much, and please join us. For